Erysipelas terexrusiopathiae may be one of the most difficult organisms to say, and the management of these diseases in pigs, poultry, and fish is no less challenging to deal with. Before we get into this lecture, I'd like you to practice pronouncing the name of this organism. As a future veterinarian, it's critical that you're able to confidently use the language of infectious diseases. Struggling to pronounce bacterial names can really undermine your credibility as a professional. So give it a try. Erysipelothrix rusiopathiae. Erysipelothrix rusiopathiae. This is a genus of biocontainment level two organisms. They are non-spore forming, gram positive rods, as you can see in the cartoon here. They're slender and non-branching, and they may form chains on gram stain. Colonies vary from really irregular to very smooth. And you'll see in the next slide what these colonies look like and how that, mor how that colony morphology relates to the morphology of the individual cells. Erysipelothrix are facultatively anaerobic, so they're able to grow under anaerobic conditions. And their growth is enhanced in a capnophilic environment, so with 5 to 10% CO2. On blood agar, they're gamma hemolytic, so typically not hemolytic, or weakly alpha hemolytic. And these bacteria are all catalase negative. Here you can see variability in colony morphology and also morphology of the individual cells. And what's really interesting is that as our colonies go from very smooth and regular, to more and more irregular, our cells do the opposite. So the smoothest colonies tend to have the most crooked or kinky or cheese doodle morphology cells, while our most irregular colonies have the smoothest and most regular cells. So there's this inverse relationship between cellular regularity and colony regularity. This is a pure culture of Erysipelothrix rusiopathiae on blood agar, and you can see these small, creamy, slightly yellow colonies uh, here in the fourth streak. We have some gram stains um, of a pure culture, and I think this would be an example of kind of a smooth intermediate form. It's sort of somewhere in the middle. The cells do have these kinks in them, but they're not quite as irregular as they could be. Erysipelothrix rusiopathiae is widely disseminated. It can be found in the environment, and it's actually quite resistant to high salt concentrations, drying, and even pickling. It's associated with many animal species. We see infections in mammals, birds, reptiles, amphibians, and it's actually a member of the normal microbial community of fish slime. In an agricultural context, healthy carrier animals are the primary source of infections, where the bacteria is shed in the feces and other secretions. So transmission occur sort of through direct contact or also through environmental contamination. Erysipelothrix rusiopathiae has been shown to survive for up to six months in pig feces. So environmental persistence is certainly a possibility. We have eight species within the genus Erysipelothrix, um, with rusiopathiae being our most important, and then tonsillarum being of secondary importance. These two species are actually biochemically identical, except for the ability of rusiopathiae to ferment sucrose. Um, historically, Erysipelothrix tonsillarum was actually ca categorized as a serotype of Erysipelothrix rusiopathiae. This genus is also characterized by its production of hydrogen sulfide on the TSI slant uh, biochemical test, and this can be useful for differentiating it from other gram-positive rods, such as lactobacillus or listeria. A number of virulence factors have been identified, including the presence of capsules, which provides resistance to phagocytosis, and experimentally, capsule-deficient strains have been shown to be unable to cause disease in mice. Erysipelothrix rusiopathiae also produces neuraminidases, which promote attachment and aid in cellular invasion, and the virulence of a particular strain has been shown to be related to the level of expression of neuraminidase. Strains which highly express this enzyme are more virulent than strains with a lower level of expression. And finally, hyaluronidase, 
which has a role in invasion, as we've talked about uh, with other bacterial species. Erysipelothrix rusiopathiae is associated with disease in a wide variety of hosts. In a veterinary context, pigs are probably the most well recognized, where it causes a disease called erysipelas um, or diamond skin disease. In poultry, particularly turkeys, we see sepsis and endocarditis. In wild ungulates in Western Canada and in the Canadian Arctic, Erysipelothrix rusiopathiae has been isolated from animals that have died in mass mortality events, and so it may be playing a role in die-offs of really charismatic megafauna, such as uh, caribou and muskox. And then in people, Erysipelothrix rusiopathiae causes erysiploid, which is a skin infection, as well as systemic infections or sepsis and even endocarditis. Erysipelothrix tonsillarum causes endocarditis in dogs, but in pigs is thought to be non-pathogenic. And then finally, among ornamental fish, Erysipelothrix uh, piscisicarius has been recently identified um, as a cause of sepsis and necrosis. So in pigs, we typically see Erysipelothrix infections in animals older than three months. And we think that this is due to waning maternal immunity. So those antibodies that the piglets get for their mother persist for a period of time. And when they start to decline, um, that's when we see increasing susceptibility. Exposure occurs orally, so typically through food or water, and it's maintained in the herd through healthy carriers. So there's a reservoir of it uh, potentially present. It enters the body through the palatine tonsils in the back of the throat, followed by systemic spread. So we get bacteremia. And we can divide disease in pigs into acute, subacute, and chronic syndromes. So these temporal markers of disease with acute being rapidly progressive, subacute somewhat slower, and chronic um, occurring over days to weeks. In acute disease, we see depression, inappetence, pyrexia, and sometimes just sudden death. You may only find dead animals. The development of these very characteristic diamond skin lesions, so you can see here we've got these little cartoon diamonds, um, occur two to three days after exposure. But in very severe cases, those diamond lesions may not actually have time to develop before death. So not finding these doesn't mean that a herd is not infected with erysipelothrix. In subacute disease, Really what we see is a, a milder form. It's less severe than in the acute syndrome. And then in chronically affected animals, uh, what we're really talking about are the long-term sequelae following acute disease. So these animals are arthritic, their stiffness, possibly they have cardiac insufficiency. Um, we know that erysipelothrix has a predilection for causing mitral valve endocarditis um, in the acute phase of disease. In this image here, you can see very classical diamond skin lesions um, in a pig that's affected. And these lesions are caused by infarction of the vasculature. So we have the presence of thrombi or clots, which include sort of those terminal capillary beds. In pigs, capillary beds uh, within this diamond shape uh, distribution are vascularized by a single sort of terminal uh, arteriole. So the vascular anatomy can be directly related to what you see clinically. On the left, you can see uh, a pig heart, which has been opened up. And what I hope you can appreciate are the presence of vegetative lesions on the mitral valve. So these large sort of cauliflower-like structures are highly abnormal. This is the growth of bacteria and, and proliferative lesions associated with bacterial valvular endocarditis. And then on the right, we have ear tip necrosis due to severe thrombosis. So again, clotting, uh, preventing blood flow to those terminal capillary beds. When blood flow is sufficiently impeded, we get necrosis um, of tissues, which is what you're seeing here. And then finally, here we have a proliferative synovitis in a pig um, associated with chronic erysipelothrix infections. So this proliferative growth of uh, tissues within the joint um, is abnormal. In turkeys, the route of exposure uh, to erysipelothrix has not been determined, although presumably it's oral, just like in pigs. The incubation period of natural infections is unknown, although experimentally disease has been reproduced after two to five days. 
the onset of disease is oftentimes per acute to acute. So it happens very, very quickly. Oftentimes it begins simply with the death of several birds, while others are sort of appearing droopy and unwell. The toms, so the male turkeys, can have congested and purple snoods. Death can oftentimes occur so rapidly that we don't actually have time for pathological lesions to develop. So a postmortem examination of the bird may be really unrewarding. Um, in birds which do die, endocarditis is frequently the cause and certainly explains uh, the rapid death. Uh, the heart is a, a critical organ and interfering with its proper functioning is rapidly uh, fatal. The mortality range in affected flocks is from 2 to 25 percent, so it can certainly have a large economic cost uh, in, in affected operations. Erysipelothrix rusiopathiae also seems to be an emerging pathogen in wild ungulates in Canada. Um, this story started in the summer of 2012 when 150 dead muskox, so these uh, large Arctic uh, ruminants uh, were found on Banks Island in the Canadian Arctic, and Erysipelothrix rusiopathiae was isolated from the long bones. So the femur is one of the, the last places where we get postmortem invasion of bacteria, and by culturing Erysipelothrix from these sites, it was highly suggestive that this organism may have played a role in the death of these animals. This wildlife mortality seems to be a new phenomenon. It's not something that's been recognized previously. And there's a few possible reasons for this. Um, perhaps we have a naive population um, and animals that are really only just encountering Erysipelothrix rusiopathiae for the first time, so they have no natural immunity. Or it may be secondary to stress. So we have a highly susceptible population due to warmer than normal temperatures who are more prone to developing infections. More recently, Erysipelothrix rusiopathiae has also been recovered um, from dead caribou and other wild ungulates in the province of British, British Columbia. So it's not isolated to uh, the Arctic. For anyone who's interested in learning more about Erysipelothrix in uh, these wild muskox populations, I've put a link in the description below to an article from Canadian Geographic magazine that describes this early outbreak. Mm -hmm.